Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime's session on providing information about active travel. Um, welcome to uh, the latest in the series of uh, Vartig uh, webinars that we're doing. Um, we are recording this session so that we can uh, share it with you afterwards and you can share it with colleagues that haven't been able to join us live. Um, and um, please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions as we go along. Uh, I'm Tim Rivet, I'm the General Manager of Artig, and I'm your uh, host and presenter this afternoon. So uh, we're going to um, have a look at um, uh, a quick look at what active travel is and a definition of it um, to help us uh, focus what we're going to talk about. Um, have a look at some of the challenges um, that arise uh, throughout it. Have a look at some examples. It's always good to see what other people are doing and then um, touch on uh, some of the data and the standards and, and how available the data is. Um, and then uh, we'll open up for a Q&A um, at the end because uh, we're keen to understand what more you might want us as RT to be doing on this sort of uh, agenda. So um, let's start off with uh, Public Health England's uh, definition of active travel because I quite like it. Um, making everyday journeys in physically active ways such as by walking or cycling instead of using cars motorbikes or other motorized transport um, lots of other people um, link uh, public transport to active travel because inevitably you're not going to have a bus stop exactly outside either where you're getting on or getting off um, and so uh, there's an element of walking and particularly if it's a, a train cycling to access it. So um, there's at least partial uh, activity as part of public transport use. Um, there's been quite a bit of focus um, recently on it, not least because bus service improvement plans, whilst uh, focused on bus services, recognises in a good number of places in the guidance and uh, supporting material uh, that active elements are going to be important so talking about uh, interchanges uh, with walking and cycling as well as between buses um, making sure you've got storage and provision docks or places for e-scooters and e-bikes um, and it does recognize that bus journeys aren't made in isolation they're part of an overall journey package um, and um, very bold um, suggestion that uh, they'll be bookable through a single multimodal system um, so that's perhaps the uh, the most challenging and least understood of uh, active travel um, but active travel gives us quite an opportunity because um by promoting it um you can have quite a positive impact on patronage of public transport um some people um suggest that um there's some abstraction and things like that but um it's a really good way of sorting that first and last mile solution um you know the, the bit of the journey to and from stops um what you can do to, uh, to, to speed that up. Um, encouraging people to use active travel for shorter trips can actually increase ridership uh, for the longer ones. Um, and there's some evidence there, particularly from uh, France and uh, the Netherlands. Um, people are uh, more likely to accept having to use public transport, make the journey to public transport if they're already incorporating active travel into their uh, daily routines, because you know they're a bit fitter, they're they're more to understand it a bit more. So um, that's an interesting link. Um, it 
can also help reduce traffic congestion and air pollution, um, particularly um, where people are living um, close enough to a centre, um, but far enough away that they might think about using the car. You know, suddenly you've got a bus lane, uh, a, a cycle lane or um, improvements to, to crossings and major roads and things like that. People are more likely to um, make use, use active travel to get to where they're going to get to, which means that uh, you've got fewer cars on the road, reduced um, congestion, which helps improve buses, bus journey times, um, making them more attractive. Um, and so uh, whilst typically Artig would think about and, and you know, bus users think about um, it as a as a as a challenge um, actually uh, there's some big opportunities so it's worth putting in some effort um, to to make sure that active travel is as attractive as possible because of the knock-on effects there are some significant challenges particularly if people aren't um, walking um, you know, most people have shoes and things like that but if you're gonna um, use a, uh, a scooter or a bike, for example. Um, there are some accessibility challenges. You know, actually, if you don't have it yourself, um, where are they? Um, how do I find them? How do I access them? Um, as well as um, how can I use them if I've got a uh, disability? Um, may not be a significant disability, um, but it may be enough to mean that uh, that I can't use a particular mode um, because of the uh, impairment that I've got. Um, there's, I think, increasing problem of equity of access. Um, uh, if you are in a major city, uh, London, Manchester, you've got lots of opportunities uh, of access to uh, bike hire schemes, uh, scooters and the like. But if you're in a smaller uh, town, um, they're not there yet um, and you don't have those opportunities. So I think that's that's a challenge that we need to um, consider and work out how we can uh, improve that equity uh, of access. Um, there's quite a fear of abstraction from bus and light rail. Uh, you can make um, probably quite a lot of the shorter bus journeys, in particular um, on a bike uh, or an e-scooter. But because of the distance away from centres, they're also likely to be fairly busy services and journeys. And so therefore, actually, some people moving off onto active travel modes will free up the space for new passengers uh, into public transport. So uh, overall, um, there's uh, there's opportunity that should be uh, taken. Um, probably the biggest challenge at the moment um, is if you're wanting to um, make part or all of your journey using active travel, um then you end up having to have a multitude of apps or websites to try and plan your journeys you know where are these um, locations that i can get um, a scooter um what sort of what make of scooter is it have i got the right app to be able to unlock it and pay for it uh, and where do I put it back? So at the moment, you end up having to have a pile of different apps uh, on your phone. And it's quite difficult to really plan those sort of things unless you're particularly dedicated um, or doing living in an area and making that journey on a regular basis. So once you've decided that you're going to uh, walk or cycle or, or scooter somewhere, um, your first challenge really is route finding. 
So um, you're on the ground um, and um, navigating around is uh, challenging potentially. Not everywhere has got good um, wayfinding uh, that is consistent. Um, so um, are the finger posts that you might see uh, around a location using the same terminology for places as you would find on a map? Um, are they um, consistent with what's on um, the app that you might have? Um, because if they're not, you end up um, getting into um, difficulties with not being really sh quite sure where you're going to go um, and um, that um, uh, what's the right word um, um, you're, you're worried and nervous whether you're in the right place and going in the right direction that anxiety um, starts to build um, so um, it's quite important to um, think about the locations that people might use as waypoints um, and handrails to get to their ultimate destination because it's highly unlikely that um, you're going to get every destination for somebody uh, showing on a finger post or, or on a map because you know people a lot of the time won't go to uh, the museum they're trying to find um, an office or something like that um, but um, you can see on a map in advance you know how oh, well it's by you know the old Vic um, so uh, that's a uh, high profile location uh, it's going to be on the finger post um, it's going to be on my map so I know that if I navigate to the old Vic um, actually where I want to be is just round the corner um, and so I don't have to always have the map out in my hand or the phone out um, looking at the map to make sure that I'm in the right place I can walk um, and have or, or uh, use whatever mode um, and you have the confidence to be able to uh, to get there reducing that anxiety um, and that's the key is is that consistency um, and giving people those uh, waypoints, if you like, to help them get to their ultimate destination. Um, there are some um, challenges. The picture of the uh, of the finger post in in Bristol. Um, uh, if you're walking, uh, you're going to take you a few seconds to go past it, so you can comfortably um, read it and make sure that you're going in the right direction but if you're on a bike or a scooter traveling faster is that big enough to be able to read um, as you're traveling past and uh, worrying about you know falling off well at least i do anyway um some of you may be more confident in these things um but uh, you know when you're traveling a bit faster these things need to be a bit more legible you need to uh, to think about the mode that people are using um, there's some really good examples um, out there so you know you've probably all seen um, finger posts where they've got cycle routes and walking routes and things like that um, they're normally big enough um, but they show less information than the finger post on the previous example um, but you know they're usable when you're traveling at speed if you're cycling um, in some places there's um, um, bigger signs on um, cycling routes um, uh, telling you how, some of the key points how to cross the road um, uh, how far you've got to go and making sure people are going in the right direction um, where you um, have got um, more dedicated lanes um, I really like this example um, from Australia where they've clearly thought about um, helping people navigate um, uh, on the segregation they've got direction um, things that are easy for somebody cycling who might be looking down 
um, towards you know where their stop line is, um, where they're slowing down to make a turn, just giving them that confidence that they're going in the right direction. Show some thought. Um, some schools um, in the UK um, are um, always under pressure to um, reduce car use and encourage people to uh, to walk and cycling. Uh, cycle. Um, this is an interesting example. There's plenty of them out there where they've gone and looked at the roads in in and around a school area and identified um, which roads are better for cycling or not. So in this example, solid green, nice quiet road. You know, for a child, that's going to be a nice safe road on where it's dotted with amber uh, you know there's a bit more traffic you need to be a bit more careful a bit more experienced and um the uh, the orange roads are areas where actually there's an off there's a lot of traffic and you're gonna have to be very experienced to cycle um along there as a child so it gives people some idea about um options for traveling as they're building confidence um and a lot of schools have got this sort of thing um but outside of the schools there there's not that many places in the uk at least that have that have put the effort in to to help people with the confidence um over in the states uh in portland um they've got a mapping system that gives you some more of that um confidence in the city center a bit like the uh the school example um giving people some idea about how busy um the roads are um what it's going to be like to cycle on them and how easy um is it so you know everything from um you know nice simple roadway to ones where um actually there's some difficult um connections there's some um high speed vehicles all the way through to actually you probably don't want to be cycling on this you might want to uh, actually get off and use the, the footpath um or uh try a different route um giving people that confidence again um and that's consistent there with some of the signs on the street as well um if you're working um the big question um, is always how far um, there are lots of different approaches um, to that time and distance um, there's plenty of evidence though that people don't understand kilometers or miles really um, when they're told something is you know a kilometer away or a mile away they struggle to um, understand how long that's going to take um, so um, in these examples from um, passenger app, um, you know, it's uh, how long, so uh, nine minutes, eight minutes walking. Um, if you know that you're um, a slow walker, most people can um, work out how to adjust that time to fit their pace quite easily. Um, and um in this case they're using the number of steps that's a you know and, and a helpful you know if you do this then you're working towards your ten thousand steps a day but it also gives people um a bit more of an idea about actually how far is it because people can um understand you know 10 steps is to the other side of the room type thing so um, think about how you can present um, information that in different ways that are that are useful for um, people. Um, one thing that um, not many um, or um, yeah, not many because I have seen it in some far eastern places, um, varying um, the distance um, and the time taken at different times of the year and weather. Um, you know, if it's wet, people aren't going to want to walk as far. Um, if it's dark, particularly uh, if it's a less busy area, you know, an industrial area, industrialized area, 
people are less likely to want to walk um, through those. So um, some of the routing um, uh, needs to be considered in that. Um, and that's where um, uh, providing people with um, the additional information beyond just roads is useful. So, you know, where are those footpaths, those jitties, generals, whatever you want to call it, depends on where you're from in the country. Um, uh, that helps people make shortcuts, um, but some of those may be less suitable in, in, you know, in the dark, uh, for example. Um, they're not, whilst some mapping services have them, so, for example, OpenStreetMap, um, has most of them they're not always coded correctly to be routable if you've got a walking journey plan as an example um, but most are um, there's a new data set from ordnance survey which will be uh, more useful for routing walking and cycling um, that's uh, that's in the process of being launched um looking that looks at pavements and, and things like that um rather than just uh roads so there are some mapping services that will be helpful um for that as with the cycling um schools uh, have done quite a lot of work um on this um fewer councils have in in in, in urban environments but some have so example on the right uh, uh, where you can uh, walk and cycle between roads to help uh, make it easier to get from uh, A to B without having to take traditional road detours and things like that. So uh, there's some examples. Um, if you're um, making an active travel journey, it's almost inevitable that it's going to be multimodal. Um, you know, you might cycle some of it, walk or, you know, push the bike, the rest of it, get a train for some of it, um, or you're walking to uh, a bus or a tram or something like that. Um, so how do you piece those together? Um, we're used to um, journey planners that will walk you to a bus stop. There's plenty of examples of those, um, but there are fewer examples of properly multimodal journey planners um, that will um, tell you, for example, um, uh, actually there's a, you could cycle this and get a train for this bit, um, or, um, you know, uh, where there are, you know, bike um, hire places that you could use to, to make that journey. Um, and to do that, you need to understand the availability of the modes. It's only in the last couple of years, really, that um, a lot of these um, active um, bike hire and scooter hire um, locations have um, really uh, come into the fore and in particular have live information. And we'll talk about the data in a bit. Um, and that helps you, that information helps with that availability of modes. It's no good telling somebody to, you know, rent a bike for this bit of the journey when uh, actually they're all uh, taken. Um, and you need to understand customer preferences. Um, there was a push a few years ago um, to, to help people with journey planners. You know, I'm a slow walker or I don't like to walk more than uh, 500 meters or a kilometer um, and that would then um, adjust your journey plans um, but um, there's a really good example which has been um, fairly recently launched in Dublin um, trapeze uh, the developer um, behind it where you've got um, properly multimodal um, journey planning options so if you um, want to go from a, one location to another, it'll give you um, the um, uh, public transport options. Um, it'll give you taxi options, 
but for these purposes um it'll tell you how to walk or actually you've got there's a there's a this is how you can um cycle it um uh, if you've got a bike in this case it's going to take you about nine minutes but if you don't and you're going to do bike hire um then it's going to take you a bit longer because you know you obviously have to walk to the place where you're going to get the bike you're going to have to unlock it and, and take it back to a docking station um but um it's one of the few examples of actually giving people the full range of options and understanding um the availability uh, of the bikes and the scooters and then um giving you um the cycle in this case the cycling um routing um with um how busy those roads are um which gives you that uh, concept of um uh, actually if i'm if i'm a confident cyclist then that's probably fine um but if i'm not then perhaps i want to take a different route and it for example um gives you um uh down here um oops, sorry the um uh you are you're on a segregated um the bus lane that allows cycles in um alongside a really busy road so uh, giving you that that confidence um if you don't have um that level of um technology capability then um actually uh cross publicity works quite well in this example um this is passenger website and app for go ahead in bournemouth um where they've got integration with barrel bikes and uh, whoever the scooter um people are in the area um to cross promote so yes you can see the public transport bus options but you can also see that there's uh, a, uh, a a bike hire and e-scooter um place and how many uh, there are available um at that point in time um tom from passenger did a presentation for us a bit over a year ago on that if you want to um, find out more about what they've been doing um but you know there's a number of people doing that sort of level of integration um as well um you don't have to have a lot of technology um to be able to cross promote um in nottingham for example on the tram network they've just got walking maps available for each uh tram stop gives people that confidence that actually this is where i'm getting off it's in the middle of the map um and it's consistent with what's on street with the key destinations um giving people that confidence to make that last uh, little bit of the journey uh, by foot uh, for example um one of the um challenges um that lots of people have um is they put in place a scheme um and it's not promoted properly um because there are some real challenges justifying marketing particularly in the political climate at the moment um but if you've spent you know a million pounds putting in um cycle lanes um why wouldn't you spend you know a proportion of that promoting it encouraging people to use it um because if you don't then how can you justify the next set of investment if people don't know it's there and aren't using it so um, yes it's a challenge but it's really important to promote that um, and it's important to help provide people with the pointers in their at their life points where um, people are more likely to make a change in the way that they travel um, TFGM have got uh, a useful, um, these are the ways to get to your um, office uh, for employees that they're, that they're pushing. You know, this is how you find out about 
um, walking and cycling or, or public transport. This is how you plan your journeys. Um, people will reconsider the ways that they travel um, uh, when they change jobs, when they move house. Uh, we've all seen the, the work that's been done on that uh, multiple times. Um, but also, um, you know, take the opportunity to push these things around new initiatives and infrastructure projects and things like that. Um, you know, knock on businesses' doors. You know, have you seen what's going on outside? Well, this will help you get here in a greener, more active way. Um, uh, one of the um, infrastructure type things that you might think about um, is looking at travel hubs mini interchange points where people can um, pick up bikes, drop them off, um, uh, interchange with, with cars and things like that. Um, there's quite a lot of push um, for these uh, hub type things um, over the last couple of years, um, growing uh, numbers in the continent. And there's a few being developed here. Um, one of the um, places to have a look at um, if you're um, thinking about this sort of thing is Como UK, who are doing quite a lot of work on um, coming up with ways of certifying uh, hub type places. You know, have you got the right sort of information? Is it well signposted? Is it well lit? what facilities have you got there um, and uh, they've done some interesting work in um, new large development housing developments and things like that to uh, encourage people to do active travel and reduce car dependency and things like that um, all the way through to um, uh, more ad hoc type places um, where uh, people have done things um, in a uh, less expensive way, but actually achieving the same ends. Um, all of this um, integration um, needs data. Um, as we uh, started out, uh, one of the challenges um, is you're going to have to have multiple apps for a lot of this. You, know, you need a app lock the bike to pay for it uh, you need a different app quite often to um, find out about public transport options and pay for those um, and that just sets barriers to uh, to adoption um, and um, one of the uh, challenges that if you're an authority you you end up with is you're very focused on uh, doing something in your area but the providers of active travel modes they're often operating at a national or an international level um, and uh, the last thing that they want to be doing is integrating with uh, council a and council b because that's really expensive for them um, it's much easier for them to um, make data available and people integrate with them. But that means that that's more expensive for authorities. But to be perfectly honest, it's probably the only way that you're going to get um, access to the data um, is by using integrating in the way that they want. Um, but that means that um if you if you do that and you can integrate the information um people are more likely to use it the information side of things is easy um what's much harder um is sorting out payments because everybody likes to be in control of that uh, and how do you make sure the right people are getting the right money and things like that um, that's a whole different um, set of um, conversations um, and uh, gets you really into the territory uh, of um, mobility as a service 
um, and there's plenty of other people that are talking about that um, and the challenges and how to deal with that. But from an information point of view, um, there's a couple of standards out there for um, uh, active travel modes. Um, probably the most popular, certainly the most uh, widespread worldwide um, is general bike feed specification similar to uh, the GTFS standard that's used for public transport. Um, that encompasses bike share and e-scooters, docked and undocked. Um, and technically, it's really quite easy to integrate with. Uh, it's a nice, easy, simple format. Um, can provide you with all the sort of bits of information you might want to be providing to a customer of an app um, and it includes things like pricing and terms and things like that what it doesn't enable you to do of course is is the payment side of things um, but it gives you the information and, and quite a lot of uh, detail for that all the way through to um, you know where there are speed restrictions in an area to start uh, or you know where you can't go um, and uh, parking bays for them, you know, where do you drop them off, where do you pick them up, um, that sort of thing. Um, so that's uh, how a lot of the uh, providers, you know, the barrels, the limes of this world, they all support um, uh, general bike feed specification. Um, in Europe um, and in the UK, most of our public transport and mobility data standards fall within the trans model ecosystem. Um, so that's uh, that's the language and the definition of how um, public transport data is shared. Um, there was been over the last couple of years um, some work to make the, the, the implementation standards like NetEx and Siri support what's called um, in Transmodel new modes. So vehicle sharing and pooling, um, the rental stuff. And that's, you know, it doesn't matter whether that's a, uh, a, a car or a scooter or a bike, whatever it is, um, they all fit under uh, new modes. Um, NetEx has got things in there um, to um, cover all of the the more static thing information that you need um, on vehicles and fleets, um, all of the stuff that the um, general bike feed stuff did, um, but also includes uh, information about user accounts and things like that. Um, So the NetEx side of things um, is the, the more static stuff. Um, Siri, which we're used to from a public transport perspective, um, where is the bus and the different guises of that. Um, but for the new modes, um, it includes, it's, it's all the live stuff. So you know how many vehicles are at that pickup point. Well, that drop off, you know, are there are there spaces there? Um, where are those vehicles? So, you know, not every bike scheme needs you to take it back to a particular place. I'm sure you know, you've seen scooters and bikes being left around, or at least the news, if you've not um, been unfortunate enough to fall over one. Um, you know, they, they can be left in, uh, you know, pretty much anywhere in some schemes. And so, um, you know, actually, where are they? That's that's one of the first challenges. So you can share that information um, and um, charge state to vehicles and things like that. That's all available um, through Siri um, and is starting to be uh, implemented. Um, there's... Uh, some more information on that um, and a video and things like that that the data for PT project 
um, which in previous sessions we've talked about, um, they've done something there to give some more information and background on it if you're wanting to uh, use um, NetEx or Siri for any of this. So we've looked at um, what active travel is. We've looked at some of the challenges and a load of examples of um, how other people have done it um, and uh, the data standards. Um, we're then um, over to you with any questions you've got. Um, I'm interested in knowing what you would want to see Artig doing um, in this area, whether you've got any challenges that we might be able to um, get a group together to, to help with, for example. I um, don't know whether anybody's got any questions or thoughts on that. No. OK, um, my details will be on a slide in a couple um, while you're having a think. Um, we're um, planning our AGM um, on the 22nd of March. Um, and because we know that none of you would turn up to that if it was just the AGM, um, we've put in a wrap around it um, workshop. Um, with uh, speakers uh, and lunch, if that helps attract you, um, looking at what's happening in public transport, information and technology, a bit of a, a look at a whole sort of uh, range of things um, rather than a particular topic, but we're going to have people talking about what's happening on the ground with the content management to display interface where that's actually been implemented. Um, there's some interesting things happening um, with on vehicle equipment and standardizing that and some new exciting technologies that people are going to talk about. And if you're doing something that you want to share um, that's, that's new and exciting, then uh, do let us know. There are still slots available. Um, and uh, and we'll start to promote that um, once we've got a uh, venue sorted out. We're in the process of negotiating with a couple of places at the moment. So um, has anybody come up with any questions yet? No? OK, in which case, um, Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you for joining and listening and watching. Uh, if you do have any questions or um, thoughts and want to um, talk at the workshop, then please do get in contact. Uh, details are on the screen. Um, thank you and have a good rest of the day. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.